Today's session will be dealing with um, the Arizona Administrative Code's Article 2 for hospitals. Okay, already. Thank you. All right, first thing I wanted to talk about was the um, strategic priorities for our department. And um, this slide, what this slide represents is um, the strategic priorities that have been developed by our, lead our leadership team under the leadership of Will Humbo, who is um, actually, before we do that, why don't we go over the um, organizational chart so you can see all of the different people that are incorporated here in our leadership. Um, on the top, if you look at this form, on the top, Jan Brewer is our governor, and underneath her is um, Will Humble, who is our director for the Department of Health. Currently, our deputy director is a vacant position, um, but below that, you will see that we have Kara Christ, who is our assistant director for licensing services. We have um, two new representatives that have recently joined us that um, fall under Kara's direction, and that is Claudia Montez, who is our epidemiology specialist. And we also have Rob Bailey, who is our administ administrative services officer. He will be handling all of our data management and quality improvement issues. And then um, Andrea Schonecker is our program specialist, and she works also with Kara. Um, then our department is divided into two divisions. We have the um, healthcare licensing division, and then we have the centralized services. Under healthcare licensing, we have a new branch chief, and that is Catherine McKenna. And underneath her would be Connie Belden, who I've introduced to you. We have Richard Young, who does our long-term care, and we have Diana Eccles, who is the Acting Bureau Chief for Residential Licensing. Um, we also have a vacant position for our Fire Marshal Team Leader, and then um, under Kathy's direction is Lois Adams and Savita Chandra Gary, who are both of our architects. Um, on the other side, you will see that we have Tom Barlow, who became our new branch chief for centralized services. And included in that um, area is special licensing, child care licensing, health program management automation, and pro uh, program project specialists. Now I wanted to review the strategic priorities. With the Department of Health, um, we have an overall goal um, that has been developed this year to achieve targeted improvements in public health outcomes. Um, and under that goal, there are five different um, sections that talk about Arizona's winnable battles, integrating health and behavioral health services, promoting and protecting public health and safety, strengthening statewide public health systems, and maximizing, maximizing the Department of um, Effectiveness. The thing that we're going to concentrate on and the reason why you're here today is that we have recently um, started integrating physical and the behavioral health services. Um, public health licensing is changing and we are not only having an integration of our rules um, between physical and behavioral health, we are also as a department trying to integrate licensing into our public health teams. We um, are expanding our services to look at the epidemiology departments here, TB and behavioral health. So we're working along with them um, to incorporate um, with us. And then we are also integrating our services along with regulatory agencies throughout the country. Now, as you know, the integrated rules for healthcare licensing um, became effective on July 1st, 2013. And um, with these integration of rules, 
The um, goals were to reduce monetary and regulatory costs on persons or individuals, streamline the regulation process, and facilitate licensure of integrated health programs that provide both behavioral and physical health services. The, ro the rules were posted on July 1, but they will not be effective until October 1st. However, that does not mean that they are not um, active at this time. They are official rules. As we move forward and um, we do surveys in the future, um, we are anticipating that surveyors, when they are out there, will be providing a lot of technical assistance to you. Between now and March um, of next year, we are asking that the public comments with regards to all the changes that we've made with the rules. And we encourage you to stay focused on the website for updates. Currently, right now, the rules are posted on the website, and each one of you has a card with that website that uh, you can refer to. And um, at that website, you will find this presentation. You will also um, have PowerPoints and um, there are frequently asked questions that will be a component of that website. So you can go on there and get all of that information for yourself. The new and the revised articles and rules will focus on health and safety, provide regulatory consistency for all healthcare institutions, streamline the regulatory process, integrate both behavioral and physical health services, and make changes that are delineated in an applicable five-year review report. The integration plan, it's a facility will be licensed based on their highest level of services that it provides. Facilities will be able to offer a menu of services. All medical services will be provided on the direction of a physician. All nursing services will be provided under the direction of a registered nurse and all behavioral health services will be provided under the direction of a licensed behavioral health professional. All behavioral health technicians and behavioral health paraprofessionals will receive supervision or clinical oversight from a licensed behavioral health professional. The rules were filed with the Secretary of State on June 28th. Um, as I said before, the implementation of all these new rules will start as of October 1st. We are giving you specific training um, right now to assist each of you with the implementation process. You will need to start following those rules as of October. This um, will provide you with more flexibility. With this integration, it will provide you more flexibility for policies and procedures, staffing and training. And this is the website, and this is the crosswalk. You have a copy of that. What has changed with um, Article 2, which is for hospitals? We will review each of the rules, uh, the content, the definitions, the additions, the interpretation, and the article numbers. Um, we have combined with the definitions. That is Article 1 general. And for all different medical facilities, all the definitions will be included in that Article 1. So each medical facility can refer to that um, for any general information. These are the new numbers for all of the integrated rules for hospitals for um, Article 2. And as we move on to this page, anything that's in red that you see, these are the additional um, things that have changed.
in your handout, you have um, also, we have provided you with um, a spreadsheet, worksheet, that we are um, encouraging each of you to look at and see if it would be helpful for you in the future when uh, survey teams come out to survey you. That spreadsheet, the one that you're looking at there, that's the one. Um, if you want to hold it up so people can see what I'm talking that's the spreadsheet. Um, County Belgium worked real hard on creating that for um, each of the different sets of rules and in that it has all of the different rules that you would be held accountable for to be in compliance with. And it's kind of a check off sheet to help you to assess whether or not you're compliant with each section of each of the rules. Um, so we encourage you to take a look at that um, and use it um, for the future. All of our rules um, are derived based on Arizona revised statutes which are um, the law. The information that I'm going to present to you um, as we move down on the slides, you will see that there are different colors that are coded. The um, colors that are blue are the new additions to the rules. And then there are some sections where it's in red. Those are the crosswalks to the revised uh, statutes that um, you can look at. And then uh, anything that's in green is stuff that we have deleted from the pre uh, current rules. It's your responsibility to review the rules, to understand the rules, and to be able to demonstrate compliance with those rules. This is another website that you can go to if um, you wanted for um, the rule making. Okay, we're gonna start now with Article One is the general. And this deals with definitions. And as we move down, the things that have been highlighted in red are all the additions that have now um, been put into Article 1. Enforcement action is R910-110. R910-12 is tuberculosis screening. And then we um, have incorporated, because we're integrating with behavioral health, <coughs> you will see um, the addition of R91014, which is behavioral health paraprofessionals, behavioral health technicians. R91015 is nutritional and feeding assistant training programs. R91016 is counseling facilities, and R91017 is collaborating healthcare institutions. Um, as I identified before, Arizona Administrative Code, Article 1 is definitions, Article 2 will be hospital rules, and then the Arizona Revised Statutes is ARS 36-400. So these... Um, these are now all the different sections of the rules that will be held for hospitals. And the new additions are R910-225, which is psychiatric services, and R910-226, which is behavioral health observation stabilization services.
as we begin and we look at the definitions, um, a new addition under definitions is uh, the statement that talks about acuity. And what it means is acuity means a patient's need for a hospital service based on the patient's medical condition. Two and three are not additions to the rule, so I'm not going to go over those. I'm going to um, only review with you the highlighted ones that are new additional changes. Number four deals with care plans, and that means a documented guide for providing nursing services and rehabilitation services to a patient that includes measurable objectives and the methods for meeting those objectives. Now when we look at seven, there is the, um, the word device, and next to it there is the um, revised statute for it, and right below it you will see in red, that will explain um, what is included in that statute. So you have that as a crosswalk. Division means the division of emergency medical services within the department. If I'm going too fast, just let me know. Under number 17, inpatient. That means an individual who is admitted to a hospital as an inpatient according to policies and procedures, or is admitted to a hospital with the expectation that the individual will remain and receive hospital services for 24 consecutive hours or more, or receives hospital services for 24 consecutive hours or more. A multi-organized service unit means that an inpatient unit in the hospital where you have more than one organized service that may be provided to a patient in the inpatient unit. Number 22 talks about the nurse anesthetist. And again, we have the um, revised statute, Arizona revised statute, and it identifies what a certified registered nurse anesthetist means right below it. Twenty-eight talks about organized service, which means a specific medical service, such as a surgical service or emergency service provided in an area of the hospital designated for the provision of medical services. And pediatric means pertaining to an individual designated by a hospital as a child based on the hospital's criteria. Single group license indicates a license that includes authorization to operate, operate health care institutions according to uh, the Arizona Revised Statutes. And this will be referred um, later in the rules. We'll uh, elaborate more on that later on. Vital records means a registered birth certificate or a registered death certificate. Under su supplemental application requirements, there is the addition of the number of inpatient beds for each organized service, not including well baby bassinets. If applicable, the number of inpatient beds for each multi-organized service unit and, if applicable, the license occupancy for providing observation stabilization services to individuals who are under 18 years of age and individuals 18 years of age and older, and also a list in the format provided by the Department of Medical Staff Specialties and Subspecialties. Um, in the future, we are going to have a new application form that's in the process of being develop developed. 
a renewal license may submit to the department a copy of their accreditation report if the hospital is accredited and chooses to submit a copy of the accreditation report instead of receiving a compliance inspection. And that's according to the Arizona Revised Statute 36-424C. And the red portion highlights that as well. For a single group license authorized in the Arizona Revised Statutes, um, we now talk about what a satellite facility is under a single group license. And you have to submit to the department in a format provided by the department when you have a satellite facility, the name, the address, and the telephone number, the name of the administrator, and the hours of operation during which the satellite facility provides medical services, nursing services, or health-related services. A copy of the accredited satellite facility credit application report should also be submitted. And then the statute is below it for you to see what that correlates with. That's a pretty long one. <laughs> Hospital license deemed status is based on a uh, is based on accreditation. Accredited hospitals can be deemed for state licensing. When you have a full accreditation report provided with the renewal licensing application, the full accreditation report includes the full licensing date for the terms. If not, then the hospital is responsible for submitting a full report during the licensing period that includes all the dates. Accreditation agencies must have demonstrated in a full report that all facilities had on-site visits with the standards reviewed at all sites for both your inpatient and your outpatient areas. The governing authority of your facility has to notify the department at least 30 days before a satellite facility or an accredited satellite facility on a single group license terminates operation. you have to submit an application according to the requirements in Article 1, at least 60 calendar days, but not more than 120 calendar days before a satellite facility or other accredited satellite facility licensed under a single group license anticipates providing medical services, nursing services, or health-related services under a license separate from the single group license. We move on to administration. Your governing authority has to establish in writing a hospital scope of services and the qualifications for your administrator. They also have um, the organized services that are provided in the multi-organized service unit has to be according to R910-228. You have to designate an administrator in writing who has the qualifications established in Section A to B. Now, this has changed um, from it used to say that you had a baccalaureate degree or a post-baccalaureate degree in health-related fields. Now, it just says that you have um, in writing what your qualifications are that you have established. And you have to adopt a quality management program according to R910-204. Designate an acting administrator in writing who has the qualifications established in subsection A to B if the administrator is expected not to be present on the hospital's premise for more than 30 calendar days or not present on the hospital's premise for more than 30 calendar days. 
So you have to have someone who is identified um, as your acting administrator. If your um, administrator is not present during these calendar day periods. You should have it. You should have it already established in writing, right? right. Um, except as provided in A7 above, notify the department according to the Arizona Revised Statutes if there is a change of administrator and identify the name and the qualifications of the new administrator. And here's the Revised Statute that talks about what I just said. For a health care institution under a single group license, ensure that your health care institution complies with the applicable requirements in this chapter for the class or subclass of health care institution. Again, this is um, the statutes that go along with it. And an administrator is directly accountable to the governing authority of your hospital for the daily operations of the hospital and hospital services and environmental services provided by or at the hospital. So it could be contracted as well. Except as provided in Section A7, you shall designate in writing an, in, an individual who is present on the hospital premise and available and accountable for hospital services and environmental services when the administrator is not present on, on the hospital premise. The previous rule stated when the administrator was not available. Now it stresses when the administrator is not present on the hospital premise. Your administrator shall ensure that your policies and procedures are, are established, documented, and implemented that cover job description, duties, and qualifications including required skills and knowledge for personnel members, employees, volunteers, and students. There used to be a separate line item that used to talk about your volunteers and students. Now it's included along with um, your personnel members and your employees. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation training is required in R910-2065. And then below it, it still has all the same requirements that we had in the past. You have to cover patient rights, including assisting a patient who does not speak English or has a disability to become aware of patient rights. Before, it used to just say the rules that you had to cover patient rights. Now it's more specific. And it talks about um, how your non-English uh, non speaking um, patients or patients with disabilities also have to be included in those patient rights. You have to have policies and procedures that qu uh, cover quality management, including incident reporting and supporting documentation. Um, the supporting documentation was a new added feature. Um, you also have to have cover, you have to have policies that cover your contracted services. You have to cover um, policies that cover when an individual may visit a patient in the hospital, including visiting a neonate in the nursery. That's, the wording has changed a little from the past. You have to uh, policies that talk about covering patient screening. Um, that also includes admission, transport, transfer, discharge, planning, and discharge. And you have to have policies that cover the provision of hospital services. Under acuity, the policies talk about covering acuity. You have to include a process for obtaining sufficient nursing personnel to meet the needs of patients. Um, the wording that we used to have in there that said at all times was deleted. You also have to have a policy that includes when general consent 
and informed consent are required. Under the, the number four, where it talks about policies and procedures are available to personnel members, you used to have medical staff in there, that was deleted. And number six um, has been reworded into one statement. Unless otherwise documented, documentation required by this article is provided to the department in the, uh, within two hours after a department request. So when you have your surveyors coming out um, and they're asking you for specific documentation, um, in the past, we used to say that we had to have that information within a, a four hour span. It has now been changed and the um, department has to have all of that information within two hours. When documentation or information is required by this chapter to be submitted, or on behalf of a hospital, the documentation or the information is provided to the unit in the department that is responsible for licensing and monitoring the hospital. Again, under um, number two, when it talks about um, administrators of a special hospital, um, it used to say a physician or a nurse qualified in pulmonary resuscitation is on the hospital premises at all times. We deleted the at all times. Now we'll move on to quality management. A governing authority shall ensure that an ongoing quality management program is established that complies with the requirements in Arizona Revised Statute 36-445. And there is the revised statute for you. Review of the certain medical practices. The governing body of each licensed hospital or outpatient surgery center shall require that physicians admitted to practice in the hospital or center organize into committees or other organizational structures to review the professional practice within the hospital or center for the purpose of reducing morbidity and mortality and for the improvement of the care of patients provided in the institution. Such review shall include the nature, quality, and necessity of the care provided and the preventability of complications and deaths occurring in the hospital or the center. Such review needs not to identify the patient or the doctor by name, but may use a case number or some other such designation. Your facility has to have a method to evaluate the data that's collected to identify a concern about the delivery of the hospital services or the environmental services that are related to a patient care. You also have to have a method that makes changes or takes action as the result of the identification of a concern about the delivery of hospital services or environmental services related to patient care. A documentary report is submitted to the governing authority that includes an identification of each concern about the delivery of hospital services or environmental services related to patient care. As we move along, you can see where environmental services was added um, into each of those designated statements. The acuity plan is required in R910-214C2, and that is reviewed, and you have to uh, review and evaluate your acuity plan every 12 months, and the results um, have to be documented and reported to your governing authority. The reports that are required in subsection B, 2, and 3, and the supporting documentation for the reports 
are maintained for 12 months after the date of the report is submitted to the governing authority. Um, in the past, that statement used to have in it that they had to be on hospital premises, but that has been deleted. Except for information or documentation that is confidential under federal or state law, a report or documentation required in this section is provided to the department for review within two hours after the department's request. Yeah. A quick question on um, back to 2A um, and the report to the governing body on identification of each concern. Uh huh. Can that be an aggregate report? Um, it could be. But you know, as far as this is the number of calls, not each call identified separately. Is that what you're asking? Right. Yes. Okay. Okay, under contracted services, um, an administrator shall ensure that a documented list of current contracted services is, is maintained that includes a description of the contracted services that are provided. Um, in this section, you can see that there, the wording um, was reworded and some things were deleted from that previous um, rule. With personnel number 206, an administrator shall ensure that you will see that there are changes in here. Um, number one and two, three have been re revised, and this is the new um, rules that have been added for. <clears throat> what did I do there? This is the new rules that have been added for um, personnel. The qualifications, skills, and knowledge required for each type of personnel member are based on the type of physical health services or behavioral health services expected to be provided by the personnel member according to the established job description and the acuity of the patient receiving physical health services or behavioral health services from the personnel member according to the established job description. And they must include the specific skills and knowledge necessary for the personnel member to provide the expected physical health services and behavioral health services listed in the established job description. It also has to include the type and duration of education that may occur, that may allow the personnel member to acquire the specific skills and knowledge for the personnel member to provide the expected physical health services or behavioral health services listed in the established job description. And the do job description must also include the type and duration of experience that may allow the personnel member to acquire the specific skills and knowledge for the personnel member to provide the expected physical health services or behavioral health services listed in the established job description. A personnel member's skills and knowledge are verified and documented before the personnel member provides physical health services or behavioral health services and according to policies and procedures. Personnel members are present on the hospital's premise with the qualification skills and knowledge necessary to provide the service in the hospital's scope of services and meet the needs of the patient and ensure the health and safety of patients. Now, under number four, it talks about orientation has to occur within the first 30 calendar days. Um, what we have added to that is number A, and that is informing a personnel member about department rules for licensing, regulation, hospitals, and where the rules may be obtained. Um, currently, when surveyors go out um, to do their surveys, Oftentimes, when they're having interaction with staff, staff are unaware that there are state rules that they are being held accountable to. So now, um, as part of our um, additions to our state rules, we have included in there 
that you must inform your personnel members about the department rules and they need to know where they may be obtained. So that, that is an addition that's important. As part of the personal member's file, there also needs to be um, an addition to the name and the date of the personal member's start of service, their home address, and their contact telephone number. Personal records and in-service education documentation are maintained by the hospital for at least two years after the last date the personal member worked in personnel records and in-service education documentation for a personnel member who has not worked in the hospital during the previous 12 months are provided to the department within 72 hours after the department's request. So those are all the additions under personnel. Move on to um, R910-207 medical staff. You will see that um, there is really not a lot of changes related to medical staff roles. The organized governing authority um, has to conduct under 7A. The addition is that the governing body has to conduct peer review according to the statute, Title 36, Chapter 4, Article 5. and requiring that each inpatient has a medical practitioner who coordinates the inpatient's care. In the future, it always the rule always used to say has an attending physician. Now um, the statements have been changed to identify a medical practitioner who coordinates the inpatient's care. Um, uh, no, it can be an. It can be a nurse practitioner or a PA. Yeah. And as we move forward with this, you'll see there's really not a lot of changes to the medical staff rules. Um, a, verica a verification of current Arizona healthcare professional active license is according to the statute, Title 32. And except for documentation of peer review conducting, conducted according um, to the revised statute 36445. Um, with some of the rules, you're going to see that in parentheses, it's in green and it says it, it was a previous number. That's where there has been a change in the, um, the, uh, the rule itself has a new has a new number added to it, and right next to it, you'll see in green what it was previously referred under. So with admissions, it used to be under R nine ten dash two ten, but now it's R nine ten dash two zero eight. When we're looking at admissions, if a physician or a medical staff member performs a medical and history exam on a patient before admission, the physician or the medical staff member enters an interval note in the patient's medical record at the time of the admission. We move on to discharge planning. Um, that used to be previously, previously under R910-211. It's now R910-209. Again, in this section, there's not a lot of revisions. Um, under B, it talks about for inpatient discharge or a transfer that was added in of a patient. An administrator shall ensure the signature of the medical practitioner coordinating the patient's medical service is under subsection B. Um, it used to say, again, attending physician. And you'll see that under number two as well. Um, it highlights and identifies it as medical practitioner who is co um, coordinating, not the attending physician or the attending physician designee.
Number three, the revision is that it now states if the patient is not being transferred. In the past, it used to um, say that if the patient is discharged to any location other than a health care institution, there are documented discharge instructions. Again, a discharge order is documented by the medical practitioner. <coughs> and we'll move on to transport. That's now R910-210 instead of R910-212. With regards to transports of patients, policies and procedures are established, documented, and implemented that specify the process by which the sending hospital personnel members coordinate the transport and the medical services provided to a patient to protect the health and safety of the patient. Again, there was not a lot of changes under transport. Um, under F, the type of personnel member or medical staff member used to be professional it's now identified as professional personnel member or medical staff member assisting in the transport. Policies and procedures are established, documented, and implemented again that specify the process by which the receiving hospital personnel members coordinate the transport and the medical services provided. B talks about the um, requirements of an assessment of the patient by a registered nurse or a medical staff member upon arrival of the patient and before the patient is returned to the sending hospital. And that is all defined under um, Arizona Revised Statute 36-422. Anybody need that number? It should be in your handouts um, as you're going along. Again, we removed the word professional and added personal personnel member or medical staff member. And then the rule relating to transfer. It then um, identifies that policies and procedures are established, documented, and, impl and implemented that specify the process by which the sending hospital personnel member coordinates the transfer, et cetera. It, those have not changed. You will see um, throughout this with the rules, um, the wording established, documented, and implemented is Anytime it talks about policies and procedures, those are the new things that we have added where it specifies that you have to establish, document, and implement policies and procedures for the different rules. Again, we talk about the type of personnel member or medical staff member assisting in the transfer if an order requires that a patient be assisted. Um, what was deleted was the sending hospital and the receiving hospital that are licensed at separate locations and have the same Medicare number issued by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for Medicare and Medicaid are exempt from subsection A1. Um, they have taken that out. I think we'll stop here before we go on to patient rights because there are a lot of revisions um, under the patient rights section, so I'm going to give you a, a break. The bathrooms are across the hall. All set? Got it? Okay. All right, we're going to move on now with um, patient rights. Um, you will see as I move along that there are um, a lot of additional changes for this one. It used to be listed under R910-212. It's now R910, I mean, I'm sorry, it was under R910-209. It's now 212. 
an administrator shall ensure that the requirements in subsection B and patient rights in subsection C are conspicuously posted on the premises. At the time of the admission, a patient or the patient's representative receives a written copy of the requirements in subsection B and the patient rights in subsection C. And you have to have policies and procedures that are established, documented, and implemented that include how and when a patient or a patient's representative is informed of the patient rights in subsection C. And where patient rights are posted as required in subsection A1. An administrator shall ensure also that a patient is not subjected to abuse neglect, exploitation, coercion, manipulation, sexual abuse, sexual assault, seclusion, a restraint if not necessary to prevent imminent harm to self or others, retaliation for submitting a complaint to the department or any other entity, or misappropriation of pers personal and private property by a hospital's medical staff, personal members, employees, volunteers or students and section three remains the same that has no changes is there a difference in a misappropriation in the rule? misappropriation of personal and property um, we don't have one in in the rules i can get back to you on that Patient has to be is informed of, except in an emergency, alternatives to a proposed psychotropic medication or surgical uh, procedure associated with risk, um, and any complications of proposed psychotropic medication. And right below it is the definition for psychotropic medications. And then you can see the. Um, state statutes related. Oh, I'm sorry. Under number two, you have to also um, be able to obtain a schedule. The patient has to be able to obtain a schedule of hospital rates and charges required in statute 36, 436. And that statute is right here and it talks about scheduled rates. They have to be printed and posted. You give it to them when they are admitted? We give them a, a notice that says that they can request it. They can request it. Okay. There also has to be consents to photograph of a patient before a patient is photographed, except that a patient may be photographed when admitted to a hospital for identification um, and administrative purposes. And except as otherwise permitted by law, um, you have to provide written consent to the release of a patient's medical record and um, additionally added was financial records. A patient has the following rights, not to be discriminated against based on race, national origin, religion, gender, sexual orientation, age, disability, marital status, or diagnosis. They have the right to receive treatment that supports and respects the patient's individuality, choices, strengths, and abilities to receive privacy and treatment and care for personal needs, to have access to a telephone, and then to review upon written request the patient's own medical records, um, and that's according to a state statutes. And right below it is the release of medical records, the statute that it pertains to. And that's pretty lengthy. Another question about patient You have a handbook or something that you give them upon admission? We do, but um, I've been with Corporation and they've looked at 
you know, you might hear them. So this is something we would have to add it, you know, to the computer every ten minutes because everything else pretty much has already been taken care of. And you already have a phone in each of the rooms. I don't think that that would be an issue as long as they have the right and access to a phone right. and you make it available to them. And if they were, for example, down in radiology and they were touched the phone, you would get You would get one to them. Okay. Okay. Anything else? I'm going to skip over all of this. Mm -hmm. This is all relating to the statute. and say it's pretty long. Number six, they have the right to receive a referral to another health care institution if the hospital is unable to provide physical health services or behavioral health services for the patient. To participate or have the patient's representative participate in the development of or decisions concerning treatment. A lot of these are the same as what they were before. They're just kind of reworded a little differently to participate or refuse to participate in research or experimental treatment and to receive assistance from a family member, representative, or other individual in understanding, protecting, or exercising the patient's rights. So those are all the new patient right rules. Next, we'll move on to medical records. Um, medical records have to be established and maintained for each patient record according to the um, statutes Title 12, Chapter 13, Article 7.1. And again, there's not a lot of changes with medical records. Um, the only part under three where it talks about an order, they have um, removed if required by medical staff bylaws. That was taken out. And then authentication, that um, what was Previously, it said authenticated by a medical staff member. It now says authenticated by medical staff member policies and procedures. If the, ver if the order is a verbal order, it has to be authenticated by the medical staff member entering the order in the patient's medical record. It used to um, read that it was an individual entering the order in the medical record if the order is oral or telephone. But if it's a verbal order, the medical staff member really isn't entering it. It's the person they're giving it to that enters it. The order is a verbal order, right? Am I reading it wrong? Well, who is the whoever is the doctor giving that verbal order, he is the one that's going to have to authenticate that order. Right. So it's intended to say that the, whoever is verbalizing that order. order. That would be the person that has to authenticate it. It can't be another doctor then going in. So it can't be, like, for example, a hospital is usually give a nice hospital is going to be doing that work. So a nice hospital would have that patient no, it has to be done by the doctor giving the order. The patient's medical record is available to personnel members and medical staff members authorized by policies and procedures to access the medical record. What was deleted is information in the medical record is disclosed to an individual not authorized under subsection 5 only with written consent of the patient or the patient's representative or permitted by law. See? Yep. That number C, 3C, the order, if it's a verbal order, isn't it used to be authenticated previously by the individual only in the name of the The order is an oral or telephone. Yeah, our medical staff rules say that it can be member of those rules. Your medical staff rules are going to have to change. You know, for instance, if the person is, um, you know, is on call for that evening, but nobody else is going to be on vacation for two weeks, they're a member of their group. Well, if you remember, 
verbal orders are always supposed to be in an emergency. They are right. not supposed to be the standard of practice. So right. if you have a doctor giving a verbal order because there's an emergency, he should still go back once that emergency has been resolved to go in and authenticate that order. Well, I think you have to have in your policies what time frame before you want them to authenticate that. But it has to be whoever is giving that telephone order is going to have to do the. That's going to be major. Right, Connie? That is correct. That is what the rule says. And that's what it's written today. Um, and the intent with the health and safety issue as it related to um, ensuring that the physician who issued this order is the one who's authenticating it to validate that it was there. I was just looking to see if we had any other um, definitions in Article 1 that would um, talk about authentication. Yeah, well, I have an authentication, but I was looking for a verbal. Oh, sure. verbal. But it, it, I'm, I'm surprised this hasn't come up before now. So yeah. Let's wow. We'll have to jot this. Okay, under six, policies and procedures include a maximum time frame to retrieve an on-site or off-site patient's medical record at the request of the medical staff member or authorized personnel member. And you can see where the verbiage has changed from the past. An administrator shall ensure that the hospital's medical records for an inpatient contains the name and the contact information of the patient's representative, if applicable. You'll see as we move on when we're in nursing service and we talk about medications, the word biological that used to be always related with administering meds, it used to say medications and biologicals. The word biological is being removed. So you'll see that as we go on further. Names of the admitting medical staff member and medical practitioners coordinating the patient's care. Again, that um, verbiage where it used to always read attending physician, it will now always be referred to as medical practitioners coordinating the patient's care. Discharge planning is included in discharge instructions. Um, if applicable, you have to, oh, I forget what we're talking about here. Medical records. A pathology report, an autopsy report, these are all spelled out now. A lot of time when they're talking about medication information, it used to always have um, the, the word wording that talked about patient weight. That is being removed, as well as the biological. Documentation of general and, if applicable, informed consents for treatment. Um, we now added the admitting diagnosis or reason for an outpatient medical service. If applicable, a laboratory report again, a pathology report, an autopsy report. They kind of separated each one of those. Now we move on to nursing service. Um, you'll now find it under role R910214 instead of 208. And as you can see in the beginning, there's really not a lot of changes under nursing service. A nurse executive um, shall make assignments for patient care according to an acuity plan. That is one addition that is in there. Do you have, I thought you said that there's some of the tools you use to uh -huh. reduce, but it's not the same. It has the old numbers. It has the old numbers? Yeah, like 208 is still medical service. 
Oh, really? We'll get you a new one then. I, I thought we had. I thought that was the last one. Yours is okay. So there must be the old one. I'll make the one for you. Yeah. I'll have to check. I'll have to look and see some of those because I did an additional copy of some, but most of them are, should be all brand new. It does so said 208. Yeah, they're all. They're all. Okay. All right. Is this available on the web? Yeah, the tool is going to be. The tool will. Yeah. And that was it for nursing service. There really wasn't um, a lot of additions or changes with nursing service. Under surgical services, again, there's really not a lot of changes in that role as well. Doesn't look like there's any. Anesthesia services. And emergency services, they pretty much are all staying the same. Pharmaceutical services. So that's a good thing for you. There's not a lot of revisions with all of these rules. Um, the one that I pointed out already to you is a medication is administered in compliance with an order. They took out the word biological. And laboratory, I don't believe there's any changes in that one. Oh, just under number 10, again, um, the usual verbiage that policies and procedures are established, documented, and implemented. And that's in relation to procuring, storing, transfusing, and disposing of blood and blood products. Radiology services. Um, remains the same. We did remove where it's talking about a radiological technologist on duty or on call. It used to say that they had to be at all times. Now it, it doesn't designate that anymore. And then um, under 3D, the type and the amount of radiopharmaceutical used, if applicable, and you have to have um, documentation of the adverse reaction to a radiopharmaceutical, if any. Now, under intensive care services, um, it's been a rewording, and this is under the Rule 10 221. Except for a special hospital that provides only psychiatric services, an administrator of a hospital that provides intensive care services shall ensure that, and then it goes on to talk about intensive care services. So it, it um, designated with regards to psychiatric and a special hospital. Anywhere where it says at all times that was deleted and taken out. Respiratory, I believe it's just a new number for the rule, but there's no changes. Same thing for perinatal services. Where you will see changes now is under pediatric. Anybody here um, offer pediatric services in your facilities? Okay, we'll go over that. The hospital can only admit a pediatric inpatient if the hospital has the staff, equipment, and supplies available to meet the needs of the pediatric patient based on the pediatric 
patient's medical condition, and the hospital's scope of service. And that's new. The administrator shall ensure that in a multi-organized service unit, does anybody have a MOSU? You do, okay. Um, or a patient care unit that is providing medical and nursing services to an adult patient and a pediatric patient, according to this section, uh, we talks about a pediatric patient is not placed in a patient room with an adult patient, and the medication for a pediatric patient that is stored in the patient care unit is stored separately from the medication for an adult patient except as provided in subsection F and G, an administrator of the hospital that does not provide pediatric organized services may admit a pediatric inpatient only in an emergency. A hospital may use a bed in the pediatric organized service patient care unit for an adult patient if an administrator establishes, documents, and implements policies and procedures that delineate the specific conditions under which an adult patient is placed in a bed in a pediatric organized unit. And except as provided in subsection H and I, ensures that an adult patient is not placed in a pediatric organized service patient care unit if a pediatric patient is admitted to and present in the pediatric organized service patient care unit. So what it's essentially telling you is you cannot have an adult and a pediatric um, together on that same unit. Transferred out of the pediatric organized service patient care unit to an appropriate level of care when a pediatric patient is admitted to the pediatric organized service patient care unit. Subsection G only applies to a general hospital or a rural hospital that does not provide pediatric organized services, has designated in the general hospital or rural hospital scope of services, inpatient services that are available to a pediatric patient, has a license capacity of less than 100, and is located in a county with a population of less than 500,000. So all of that is talking about general rural hospitals. Do you want to hold off and ask after? Okay. okay. Just jot them down and then we can talk about it. An administrator of a general hospital or a rural general hospital that meets the criteria in subsection F shall ensure that there are pediatric appropriate equipment and supplies available based on the hospital services designated for pediatric patients in the general hospital or rural general hospital scope of service. And personal members that are or may be assigned to provide hospital services to a pediatric patient have the appropriate skills and knowledge for providing hospital services to the pediatric patient based on the general hospital and rural general hospital scope of service. Subsection I only applies to a general or a rural hospital that provides organized pediatric services in a patient care unit, has designated in the general hospital or rural general hospitals scope of services, inpatient services that are available to an adult patient in an organized pediatric service patient care unit, has a license capacity of less than 100, and is located in a county with a population of less than 500,000. An administrator of a general hospital or a rural general hospital that meets the criteria in subsection H shall comply with the requirements in subsection E1. Okay, so everyone here said that you don't have psychiatric services, correct? All right, we're going to bypass that because there's a lot of new additional information for that.
behavioral health observation or stabilization services? No? Okay. Okay. Huh? Doesn't apply to an emergency room. Gets admitted. Move to the ICU and then you're correct. But it's an ICU patient at that point. Correct. Right. Okay. Are any of you going to have single group licenses or satellites? That was 226, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Now we're moving on to rehab, rehabilitation services. And there's really no changes with that one. Um, and then we have the MOSU, the multi-organized service unit. The one change there is a unit that provides medical and nursing services to adults and pediatric patients was added in there. And what it's saying is the governing authority may designate the following as a multi-organized service unit. And it identifies that if you have um, a unit that provides both med surge and PD, it could be considered a MOSU. And then we have the um, statute that correlates with Compliance for the unit for the physical plant. R nine ten two twenty nine is social services, and there's really no changes with that one. Then we move on to infection control. And under infection control, under number two, an administrator shall ensure that an infection control program has a procedure for documenting the collection and analysis of infection control data. The actions taken related to infection and communicable diseases and reports of communicable diseases to the governing authority and the state and the county health departments. Infection control documents are maintained for at least two years after the date of the document. You have policies and procedures that are established, documented, and implemented that talk about the use of personal protective equipment <coughs> such as gowns, masks, or face protection. And this um, will be important with your dialysis units, wearing your PPE. Tuberculosis screening um, is a big thing that has been added, and so we're going to go over that. Tuberculosis screening is performed as part of the tuberculosis infection control program that complies with guidelines for preventing the transmission of mycobacterium tuberculosis in healthcare settings, according to R91012. Number, number, under number eight, this is all reorganized content. It talks about your infection control committee is established according to policies and procedures, and it tells you what it must consist of.
Next is dietary services. And there's really not um, any changes with that. And you have your disaster manual. And I'm sorry, disaster management. And there's no changes with that one. And then we move on to environmental standards. And that rule remains the same. Under physical plan standards, an administrator shall ensure that the hospital complies with the applicable physical plant health and safety codes and standards incorporated by reference in AAC R9 1-412 in effect on the date the hospital submitted architectural plans and specifications for approval to the department. An administrator shall obtain a fire inspection conducted according to the time frame established by your local fire department or your state file mark, fire marshal. You have to make any repairs or corrections stated on the inspection report and you maintain documentation of a current five of a current fire inspection report. And I believe we are at the end. <laughs>